Welcome to our podcast, Keep Walking With Me. Today, we have a very special guest, like always. And before we present our guest, I guess we can start with a question. What do you think, Nuno? That's a good idea. Let's go for it. So, in a nutshell, who is Jane Murray? Well, that's a very difficult question <laughs> to answer in a nutshell. Well, what can... I would say, yeah, I can, well, I can try. I, you know, I always think it's incredibly hard for any of us to really understand who we are, right? To understand uh, how we are to other people. So my, my idea of myself, right, is, um, so internal and so um, distinct, I think, from the impression that I give to other people that it's really, it's, I think that's an impossible question for me to answer. So um, uh, I think probably how I, um, I can give you, you know, I can give you the information, the stuff that would be on my driver's license, right, <laughs> about um, who I am in a nutshell, but that doesn't probably really speak to, um, to me internally. But uh, anyway, the brief summary, top line, is I am founder and CEO of a company called Peacebeam. I'm a mother, I'm a lawyer, and um, I am a huge lover of the enchantment of the world. So I think that that's about as close as I can get to who I am. And that's a great answer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Jane. Well, Jane, let me pick up one of the lines that you just mentioned on your, on your presentation. And tell us, how is it possible to move from law to venture capital, investment funds, and then end up beaming peace across the world? How is it possible? <laughs> How is it possible? Well, you know, I think it was, I mean, in hindsight, I can look back on this and I can think, well, it's, uh, you know, all of the stages of that journey were kind of obvious and they were interlinked in so many ways. But at the time, I think when you're, um, when you're finding your way to your kind of heart's calling, it's really, it's a very tricky journey and quite treacherous. And I think you end up in lots of dark forests and, you know, dead ends and all the rest of it. But I think, you know, the, the, the sort of summary is that I, um, I trained, I, I, I did law in university. I was very young when I went to university, unusually young. And when I was making applications for what I wanted to do, um, I wanted to be, I wanted to study art and history. And my father thought that that was really nice that we'd put it down as second choice and really what I was going to be was a lawyer so I think in summary like it was my father's vocation rather than mine um, and then I ended up working in lots of different uh, fields in law it was never a particular passion of mine but I was good enough at it you know to make a to make a living and um, I then joined a venture capital fund uh, in my sort of late 20s um, and and was attracted really by the kind of creativity of um, the startup world, entrepreneurship, all of that kind of stuff. I think again, speaking to that kind of, you know, uh, my artistic nature actually, strangely, um, I love the creativity of the startup world, but I found that the actual um, energy of that world was very difficult for me to function in, in a, in a healthy and a sane way, you know, that kind of world of cutthroat competition and, Profit at you know any cost was um, something that then really kind of made me focus on what my uh, what my values were, where my heart lay, and then I had a, a kind of a major life change in about 2015, and all of the stuff that had been internal and incubating about how you know we might uh, how I might live a different kind of life and do something in the world that was resonant with my interior. Um, that was an opportunity to do that. Uh, and I look back now, as I said at the beginning, and I think well, everything that you do is preparation for what comes next. And, you know, with, with the benefits of being as old as I am, you can look back and, and see that there was probably some overall plan. All of the various different things that I did um, have informed and helped me with what I do now. 
Wow. So. Well, that makes a lot of sense. It does, for sure. Um, and certainly that uh, wisdom is, you can only acquire it through living throughout your life. So it's not, you cannot get it beforehand. Um, thinking about the, the, the many times for sure that you have mentor, mentored um, uh, startups, probably the leaders at startups and other companies, what did you learn from mentoring other people? Well, I think um, what I really learned actually was I think that, yeah, I've had a lifelong obsession with value and what we value and what we mean by value. Um, and what, I, what I've always observed as, um, as a lawyer, as an investor and as a mentor is that um, when, uh, when we aren't clear about what it is that we really value or how we feel valued by the world. And so what we're talking about here is like really deep issues around esteem, that when we're not clear about that, that we have a lot of shadow patterns that are constructing our lives for us. And I think that that is really obvious in, in an environment that is um, as intensive and high risk and pressurized as um, the startup world or anybody who's starting a business. So I think we need to be careful about using expressions like startup and all the rest of it because they have particular implications that are, I think, I think often lead us to deviate from in fact what's happening, which is that, you know, that somebody is starting a business and, and bringing some internal part of themselves into manifestation. And with that comes all of the shadow material as well. And one thing I really learned is that if people have a bit more clarity about the shadow aspects of themselves and everybody else involved in that, that um, you're less likely to have a kind of a, the very high rate of failure that we see in the startup world or burnout that we see in people starting their own businesses. Um, so I think that that's, that's really what I've learned. And that's what I've learned personally as well, is that we have to really be willing to engage with uh, the difficult aspects of self if we are going to make really informed decisions about what is potentially good and true and beautiful. So I think that's what I learned most. I hope that made sense. It made a lot of sense. And that's I, actually a very deep uh, answer. Thank you. I just wonder if uh, more people uh, were aware of that before they start their business, actually, if they, they would start the business. That, but that's, that, you don't need to answer. It's just something that I, I put out there in the air. Um, um, you know, these days there are so many people thinking that um, capitalism seems to be incompatible with social justice and especially with, you know, our protection of uh, the environment. Um, mm -hmm. Considering your personal trajectory in life, what is your take on that? Well, I think I would, I would, I would look at it from a, from a historical um, point of view and kind of where modern capitalism has has come from and where we where, where we have arrived with it um, and i think you know in its it's had various different incarnations obviously over the kind of centuries but particularly in the last 200 years with the advent of first industrial revolution and uh, and then the kind of move through the 20th century into mass production and the kind of capitalism that was formed then i think that that um what we had was a reciprocity between um, the system of capitalism, if you like, and the kind of players in that and what was required by the citizens and consumers who were on the other side of that kind of reciprocal arrangement. And I think when that reciprocity existed and was recognized as something that would moderate and determine the trajectory of capitalism, then I think that, you know, we had... Um, ideas that formed around kind of social um, democracies and, you know, in the UK we had things like National Health Service and all of those kinds of ideas that grew up, you know, alongside that form of capitalism. So it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but there was a social contract associated with it. I think what's happened since the kind of 70s and the introduction of 
neoliberalist ideas around capitalism that the market regulates itself and all of these kind of frankly absurdities that have allowed the very worst aspects of um, capitalism, runaway greed, um, a kind of a callous disregard for the reciprocity that is required to kind of moderate those kind of relationships, then I think that there is something that has become incompatible probably with, or at least has, has overstretched the social contract um, that's required. Um, now, I think that capitalism in and of itself is not inherently a bad thing. I think what is inherently a bad thing is that we have got this re incredibly reductionist lens where all value is only considered to be valuable if we can trans translate it into fiat currency of some sort. And that's kind of at the heart of these neoliberal ideas that, you know, if it's not translatable into cash and preferably quantity of cash, then it has no value. So I think that that's where we've gone, we've gone wrong. And that idea of value and going back to our kind of esteem, how people see their place in society, the absence of that social contract. I think all of these things are, you know, are in need of a serious uh, attention. Um, and uh, where is it? I feel that we're at a perilous moment now, um, historically, and we've got some elections coming up in the US that will determine, I think, how quickly we can start to, to redress some of those imbalances. So, so interesting that you mention how value can be perceived differently in uh, different mm. moments and by, by different people. So probably this is a good time to ask you to give us a song, give us a value translated into you know, sounds and words. Mm. What would you choose as your first music? Well, I would choose um La Vie en Rose, I think, um, because every time I play this song, it l uplifts me and reminds me of what it is in the world that is enchanting. Um, and I think we have so little opportunity these days for, uh, you know, remembering what is enchanting. So that's what, that would be my first song, La Vie en Rose. So let's listen to La Vie en Rose. Well, oh. great, great listening to this song again. It is always, as you said, uplifting um, and connecting to the discussion we were having just before. Um, I, I do think this is this connects us to the to the wondrous things in the world, to the amazingness in the world. Thank you so much. So um, now, connecting to that exactly, I would ask you a, a question which is, might seem simple, but then again, you will answer. Um, if you could embark on any adventure today, just anything, there are no constraints, what would it be and why? Well, um, I think that, um, I mean, this is, uh, I suppose, this is my own personal passion. But I think what I, um, for me, what I would really love is to is to find a way to cont Well, over the last several years, I've been in a process of kind of a like radical simplification of my life, um, and uh, as that continues, I realise that what I am really incredibly drawn to is to live in a kind of a deeper connection with the land and um, my uh, my family for generations and generations are kind of peasant Irish farmers right like on the in the west of Ireland <laughs> and um, uh, I would, you know I've, I've gone very far away from that but I, I seem to find that I'm really called back to that kind of you know living in a uh, really deep connection to the land and um, and in community that is very kind of localized and um, understanding how food is produced learning how how to do that so that would that for me would be i know that probably sounds like a nightmare for most people but for me that would be a, a, the adventure that i would crave for sure well uh, quite inspiring actually in my opinion but <laughs> absolutely <laughs> Jane, let me take you to probably the, the 
opposite side <laughs> of what you just said right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> how can we pay with kindness when our salaries, they continue to be paid in different national currencies? So the question is, how can we pay in kindness when our salaries are paid in different national currencies? Okay. If it's possible. So, well, all things are possible if we're willing to hold the possibility of them, right? You know, I mean, I think that, you know, if we begin with, with defeatism, right, then nothing's possible. So uh, I, I think that's the first point that I would make. For us, right, and, and, you know, we're pioneers in kindness capitalism, if you like, you know, uh, where um, in Peace Beam we're now uh, accepting acts of kindness um, as well as money, right, as, as a currency. And how the reason that we are doing that is, is really to not because we think it's, you know, some utopian solution to the kind of ills of our, you know, neoliberalist where we've arrived at with those kind of values in the West, but because we feel that it is vital that we start to experiment with different understandings of what is valuable and that um, businesses start to undertake that degree of imaginative thinking and possibility and the, and the, 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 the space within which those questions can be held and they're difficult questions and then you start to create a field of emergence, right? Where something new can arrive out of that. But if none of us are willing to hold any of those questions, then everything just remains as an idea, right? Or a nice to have. And so we've chosen kindness capital because we profoundly believe in interconnection. Um, but again, interconnection is just a nice idea or a nice thing to say, unless you're really willing to drill down into, okay, well, what does that mean if you live it? And so what, what we're saying as a company is that if you are kind to somebody on the other side of the world, right, like that doesn't have a direct benefit to us, but we believe that because of the interconnection and the ripple effects of that, that ultimately we all benefit. And therefore that is its own regenerative currency. That, we, that is the foundation for how, as a collective, that we can thrive. So, um, so that's, that's where we view it, right? We view it as the kind of the first step in the willingness to hold these disruptive ideas in the same way, right, that all of the kind of major tech companies that have made these, frankly, I mean, you know, there isn't, there isn't that much money in the world in terms of the valuations that they have. They were willing to hold the possibilities of all of these ideas without there being any profit attached to it. And then obviously there came the Faustian pact where, you know, impatient money, investor money was demanding something back from it. And then they changed trajectory. But, you know, we have great change because we're willing to hold unusual ideas. You know, we can't, we can't solve the problems that we have with the same consciousness that created them as Einstein, you know, pointed out to us. So... That's a very long answer, Joao. Sorry yeah, about that. But. Incredible food for thought. It's a, it's a. And hopefully, whoever is listening to podcast uh, will review your answer over and over because that's probably needed. I, I absolutely uh, agree with that, uh, that statement by Einstein and by so many people, actually, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the construction that you just made, which is if we don't hold things as possible and if we keep looking at things through the same lens, we will never see a different picture. So that is the, the probably the most amazing human characteristic is that we are capable of doing that, of stepping out of our perspective and exactly. doing something new. Yeah. I think that's really right, Nona. And I think, you know, the, the, the two kind of real imperatives of what it is to be human is the instinct to survive and the instinct to create. And the two mm -hmm. go together, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Um, and I think at the moment we're locked into this kind of bleak survivalism from a psychological point of view, emotionally, mentally and physically. And I think that what we need now to break out of that is to rebalance it with our profound creativity and on our ability to imagine a different way of being. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I will connect with your adventure, connecting <laughs> to the wild, connecting to, the, to nature. And I will ask you a different question. Did you ever have a particular experience, and I will ask you because we're on a walking mentorship uh, podcast, 
that involved walking in nature or maybe just nature or maybe just walking you choose um, that impacted your life yeah i mean i would i would say i've had you know i've had so many i mean i've had these moments of you know really kind of like transcendent um connection through through walking um i have a particular uh love of forests and walking walking in forests and i'm fortunate where i live there's a huge amount of wooded areas so i have trees that i've adopted as my own which i appreciate makes me sound mad but you know i have um, um but i think probably one experience that i've had which was so profound um was when i was i was walking with a horse actually um i spent quite a lot of time working with um with horses as a way of really understanding the relationship to to power the, the uh, as a way of really unpicking shadow material and then i the, uh, there was a stables that i would go to and they had some quite troubled horses there and it was really interesting to kind of you know to understand that non-verbal communication that we're engaged in all the time and there was a particular horse called caesar who was very very troubled and we began when we first met each other where he would be on right on the other side of the field under this kind of like um section of trees and every time i would move he would kind of make sure that he was keeping the same distance and over the course of about three months we we eventually managed to approach each other and he would stand beside me he would never let me touch him but he would walk with me wherever i went kind of following me like um like a dog and that was i think one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life that this animal who had been so badly abused had the generosity and the profound soul to allow another human being to walk next to him in that way was really moving for me. Wow, that's Ch truly moving, <laughs> really. Ch change can take a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, and um... yes, it takes, <laughs> yes, I think I found it takes my whole life so far. So yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, our next question actually is not taking you the whole life, but we're going to ask you to time travel about 10 years. And how do you see the world, the world we live 10 years from now? Can you give us a picture? <laughs> oh, well, to be more precise, 2030. <laughs> 2030, yeah, 2030. Well, I think, you know, there are certain, I think there are certain uh, realities that will have to be faced in the next decade, which are um, the collision of so many different um, events, all within the framework of the um, ecological issues that we face collectively and the climate issues that we face collectively. Um, my hope is that we will have woken up to the fact that we're going to have to make a transition from a hydrocarbon economy to um, a solar economy, and that we do that in enough time that we have an infrastructure still in place to make that transition a bit more seamlessly. I, I feel that there will be a, a localization in the context of globalization that I think can be incredibly productive in terms of waking up that creativity that we were speaking about earlier. Um, and I think as Western democracies, we are going to have to accept probably that the lifestyles that we were taught to expect are never going to materialize and we'll have to make some adjustments, to, you know, some, some quite painful adjustments, but I think we will be all the better for that. That is my feeling about it. Well, maybe you can share with us another feeling and choose your second music. <laughs> My second piece, I think, um, is, uh, this is my favorite, um, my favorite song of all time. And I can't even tell you why, but it has been since I was about 10, which is um, Fly Me to the Moon. Well, then by Frank let's, Sinatra. Let's, fly, <laughs> let's to fly to the moon. Let's fly to the moon. <laughs> So we are back from the moon and let's continue our podcast. Um, Jane, you are the author of The Path of the Entrepreneur. And um, 
with a promise to understand your shadow. <laughs> um, tell us more a little bit about this um, kind of deep internal exploration and probably practical tools um, for uh, existing or future entrepreneurs. Um, do you think this is a little bit like having your own uh, kind of business coach or it's something else? How do you see it? Um, well, it was, uh, it was originally uh, commissioned by um, the London School of Economics for their accelerator, LSE Generate. And um, when I was talking to them and they were asking about, um, so Peace Beam as a, as a company, we had produced a lot of uh, meditation tracks for their student cohort and that kind of thing. And then I was speaking to them and they wanted something um, sort of kind of deeper for consideration for their accelerator, which is really focused on kind of social impact under, you know, for entrepreneurs to understand their values and that kind of thing. And as we spoke about at the beginning, you know, I was just so aware from my um, professional life and, um, and background and from having started five of my own companies um, that really getting to grips with our agendas, our motivation, and really where our power is situated um, is vital for anybody who's even considering um, starting their own business because it's, you know, we have this um, kind of brainwashing, I think, that's occurred over the last 10 years with the the kind of meteoric rise of, of, of the idea of the tech startup, that entrepreneurship is now viewed as something that is like, I don't know, something you can study in third level and it's a, it's a career choice. And actually, um, you know, you, you, you need a particular a set of archetypes in order to kind of manage that world. And you need to be really acquainted with your mental strengths and limitations, your emotional strengths and limitations. Otherwise, it's a really, it's a really tricky thing to undertake. And you ask a lot, not just of yourself, but of the people around you in your relationship. So, so the idea with, um, with that series was to kind of really break down what the steps in the journey of the entrepreneur are and what the kind of pitfalls are and, and give people a way to kind of map power in particular. And when I say power, I mean, um, Everything in our lives is an exchange of power, whether it's like whether you choose to buy a particular jacket or you're starting a company, it's everything is about, you know, how are we giving our power, which is our energy and our life force, right? And where is that distributed in our lives? And so the idea was that it would be kind of like a coaching, um, it was a way to kind of coach um, young entrepreneurs without them needing kind of 14 sessions of, you know, very expensive coaching, right? So, um, so it was to distill it into those uh, sessions where they can, and they're very detailed, you know, and there's lots of tools and exercises and meditation and all kinds of stuff that's part of it. So, but that's really what it was aimed at. And, and it was also to kind of really encourage people who are very passionate about leading that kind of life um, to kind of dig down, you know, and, and do, do the hard work at the beginning and it will pay off for you in, uh, in the long term. So. That's, that's very interesting, actually. And that connects very well to our next question. Um, and looking at the, the end product of uh, the, the, the ones you called the tech startups, which now are probably the tech giants. Um, yes. Some of them, very few of them, actually, but, but they, they started quite, quite uh, recently, and now they are total giants. And they offer mm -hmm. us free services. Um, and they seem, well, they are too omnipresent and actually too competent to be ignored. N none of us can actually say we don't, we're not going to use their services. But in a certain right. way, they have transformed the client into the product by offering these free services, which are not free, actually. Um, do you see a, an emergency exit or do you see the system has some sort of uh, way to be reformed? Yes, I mean, I think there are potentials, there are potentials for reform, but I think it will have to come through oversight, regulation and legislation. Um, before that can happen, I think there has to be a real understanding about what has what has happened in the trajectory of those 
startups about what happens when you've got incredibly impatient, entitled money that is demanding a return and all of your esteem and your credibility is kind of, um, uh, it is risked on whether or not you make that return um, where ideals and intentions that can start off um, with a great deal of altruism can be easily um, sidelined, right? When other kind of pressures, other pressures come online. And where, if you aren't clear about something as basic as the fact that um, reputation, adoration and money are really important to you, if you're really not clear about that, you're easily manipulated. You know, you're easily manipulated because you think that other things are happening, but in fact, it's that part of yourself that's being um, appealed to, right? So, um, and I think what's happened now with the kind of rise of tech is that, uh, and it, uh, it, it kind of came on the coattails of this neoliberalist agenda that has, been, that has reformed our idea of capitalism, um, that we have a new breed of capitalism that is, has a degree of complexity and interweaving in our lives that um, uh, I think it's really difficult for people to comprehend the scale of it. And it's not just that people are the product, right? It's gone far beyond, it's gone far beyond that, where we are um, the equivalent of kind of, you know, just resort resources that can be mined and the, and the uh, effectively what those companies are selling are kind of the predictions of our future behavior and that future behavior can be manipulated as we know, right? So, um, so it's gone far beyond um, our basic understanding of the contract between the company and, and, the, and the public, right? In terms of that rehabilitation, I think that it's gonna take I think it's going to take a while and I think it's going to take some very brave governments and legislators to take it on. But yes, it can be done because um, the law is slow, right? But um, its slowness is often um, helpful because then it has a huge amount of information with which to legislate effectively. Right? It's a very interesting, Jane, that you mentioned about having the courage to look uh, into things uh, uh, deep enough and, and um, seek for a, a, a better a better future. Um, mm. The economy, in at, at least in origin, at least uh, it's about you know measuring echoes, the environment, uh, etc. But we saw Bhutan, for instance, adopting this um, gross national happiness as a kind of mm. alternative method to evaluate human progress. Um, do you think it's possible to think about other economic evaluations uh, don't, that obviously don't translate necessarily into money? And um, do you think there is any value in adopting uh, such, um, let's say, more human measures um, of success? Or this is something that we also need to wait for, let's say, a, a legislation to be passed on? Um, well, I think if you are, I think there are so many different measures that we can use, right? And they're all actually fundamentally interlinked because really what we're talking about is, is health, right? Um, the health of an ecology, the health of a, um, the health of a society, the health of individuals, uh, the health of, um, interaction between nations. Um, so I think there are so many different ways that that can be measured. I personally think that happiness is a little bit reductive as well, because I, you know, this is not a natural state for human beings to be constantly happy. And I think that idea that, you know, if you're not happy, there's something wrong is dangerous, right? Um, you know, it, it, life, is a, life is a mixture of many things and we tend to grow most and expand most in our capacity for compassion when we are, you know, challenged or go through difficult, difficult circumstances or suffer in some respects. So um, I think our overall health um, 
the health of a country's soil, the health of the air, the mental health of um, the population are ways that can, um, you know, be used as as measures. Um, whether they need uh, legislation, I don't know. I would have to think about that probably for a bit longer than we have today. Um, but I think the most important thing for for all of us is that we take individual responsibility for how we are with ourselves, for how we are within our own kind of, you know, units, our, our families, our tribes, what our relationships are like with people, what is the overall health of your own immediate present moment reality. Um, and if enough of us are doing that, then there is a natural kind of over, overflow and an overspill into, you know, larger frameworks. That's uh, really wonderful to hear that, Jane, especially when we are currently living in a stage where uh, so many legislators actually are telling you exactly the way you should live your life in so many different countries around the world. It makes you yeah. uh, think, uh, wonder and probably, um, you know, question deeper. Yeah, well, especially what you mentioned about individual responsibility and the, the power each, of a, each one of us has to change the, fu the future is really something that I relate very much to because um, I, I do believe in that and, and when people tell me, well, but I cannot change the world. Well, Gandhi did and um, Mandela did and there are so many more examples and each, of, each well, one yeah. of us, we can do that. So, I mean, so, yeah, go ahead. I agree, but I would I, I would argue then, you know, that it wasn't Ga Gandhi didn't change the world or Mad Mandela didn't change the world. The people who he, he inspired and influenced changed the world. Like there was a critical mm -hmm. mass of people of that were required for those movements. And that came from the fact that those people lived, lived their values in integrity and they were inspirational of the people mm -hmm. around them. So I think it's the same. I think it's the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And we don't all have to change the world. You know, we don't all have to imagine that we have to live some huge extraordinary life that's a very 21st century idea that we have about ourselves you know the miracle and the magic and the majesty of an individual human life is in the ordinariness and our humility to be able to live our ordinary lives well right um you know i think there isn't enough talks about that we don't have not all of us are called to change the world we're not but i, I think we are changing just that in small incremental measures because yeah. The, um, the, the values that you mentioned are fundamental and if each one, if each individual is acting according to values which are human for sure, then mm -hmm. societies will improve. Um, and I think uh, in, in a very clear way you stay, of course, these examples that I mentioned, they, they were very much aligned with their values, but they, they also reflected the values of many other people who felt the same. And so right. that's why they, they actually produced the result they did. And of course, they lived in particular times. Um, but we live in particular times these days also. And I, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, if you, uh, w w not if, but in what are you planning to focus your personal energy in the coming future, in the near future? In the near future? Um well, I think what, you know, it really is in that area of, of value. And um, I am really interested to see over the next 12 months what happens with um, Kinder Pay on our platform, which is what we're calling kind of accepting acts of kindness. I'm very interested to see um, where that goes, what that generates. And we're also totally willing for that to be a complete failure, by the way. I mean, we're not kind of, you know, I, it's, it's, we're genuinely holding a question about what that will mean. Mm -hmm. um, and for me personally, I'm really, I'm really passionate about um, people understanding that their own individual lives and everything that they do means something. It has meaning, it has value it does matter because I think one of the one of the really heartbreaking aspects of our current the way we are currently organized as societies is that there is a sense that our lives don't matter that the individual experience the ordinary experience of who it is to be me or you doesn't really matter and it does everything matters everything has value intrinsically by the fact that people are alive um, 
And so I, I think, you know, for me, that really is a focus. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to do a lot more speaking um, over the next few years. I've always kind of shied away from that a bit. But I think in terms of, you know, you have to live the values that you speak and actually, you know, do what you can to kind of put these messages of, of um, positivism. And it's, not, and it's not hope unbacked by reality, right? Um, but we can't, we can't face the problems that we have as a collective if we aren't hopeful. And if we don't see that there are other people holding this creative idea of, of, of a, a world that we can imagine together. Well, for sure. That, that's, uh, that's a good invitation, I would say, uh, for you to send one more message, your, your third and last music. Uh, my third and last one um, is Miserere May. And um, this is, I think, possibly my favorite um, piece of music um, for when I become uncentered or overwhelmed, right, with, you know, despair, because that happens to all of us. And um, if I sit, and this is about 12 or 13 minutes long, if I sit and listen to this quietly, I am entirely restored by it, so. Well, let's, let's do so. And <laughs> if, um, if you like it as much as I do, I think you will hear it in repeat, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. So we are back uh, with, um, with an incredible feeling, I guess, after this music. And um, what we would like now to ask you, Jane, is to uh, build your own time capsule. So this is something we're going to launch into the infinite and beyond. <laughs> and probably one day, one year from now, under the years from now, someone is going to open that time capsule. And um, what message would you place inside? This is your, this is your time now. <laughs> what message would I place inside the time capsule? Yes. Oh dear. Well, the one that comes to me uh, immediately is obviously it's not my own, but um, yeah, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, really. Um, because I think that that is the truth. <laughs> it's the only way. It's the only way to live. But obviously, I've stolen that from somebody else. That's not mine, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> That's very, very old. <laughs> Always fair. <laughs> Always fair. Um, it's. Uh, I, I cannot avoid to make a little remark because. Um, this is a classic question, so we try to ask this question every time in the end of, uh, you know, all, oh, all, all podcasts. Podcast. Yeah. And um, it's quite remarkable to see how much people actually want to place love inside the time capsule. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it, it, I mean, in this moment, I think we can already look back and, and think Please. about some of the previous interviews we had and um, cannot avoid to think about it. I mean, maybe, maybe we should actually place a little bit more attention on, on this. That's, uh, it's, it's for sure very, very inspiring that so many people feel this same love, in fact. So uh, it's really, yeah. it's really great. Know, there isn't anything else, right? <laughs> like, I mean, other, you know, without it, <laughs> Everything else no loses meaning. sense, yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, thank you very, very much for this uh, such open and honest um, conversation we've had. We hope we weren't too hard on you, drilling you, but uh, <laughs> you for sure did great. You had amazing answers and um, it's been a huge pleasure to have you here with us. And we're really looking forward for the amazing things you're for sure going to do in the next uh, coming times. Thank you, oh, Jane. Thank you both. My pleasure. We really hope that you continue to beaming peace across the world uh, with uh, lots of love. 
which you'll do for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>